Westbrook Online, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you have uh, decided to join us today in our time of worship and teaching. And I hope and pray that as we go through this service today, God will encourage you, uh, God will bless you, God will speak to you, and uh, when the service is over, uh, you'll be glad uh, that you joined us. As we crank into a new season, as we move into uh, the fall season, uh, things are going to be changing a little bit in your world with all the back to school and, and all the fall things that are going to begin to take place. But what's not changing is our commitment to you, uh, even though you are a part of our online congregation, our online family. And as we say every week, as we get ready to move into our time of worship, we want you to do your best to stay connected to us. Contact us. Let us know that you're part of our online congregation. And we'll do our best uh, to minister to you, to encourage you, to pray for you, uh, to bless you as we share together in, in this time uh, of, of worship and trusting Christ with all that we have. So you make sure that you do that. Find whatever way you can to connect with us and let us know that you're watching and let us know that you're a part of our family. Uh, before our service ends today, take a moment, if you will, and uh, uh, remember the great sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Uh, in our on, uh, live services, we take communion together. We would love for you to share in that as well. Find a piece of uh, bread, find a cup of juice, and take some time to reflect upon what Jesus has done for you. And then we wanna encourage you to be a part of our ministry as a financial steward as well. Uh, you can give online, you can go to our website and find the information about that, but we greatly appreciate uh, your engagement. Wherever you are in this area, in this region, or in this world, uh, we're grateful that you're a part of our online family. Yeah, let me pray. And then we want you to enjoy this service. Would you bow your heads? Lord, as we come to you today, as we move into a time of worship, God, we pray that you'll be glorified, you'll be blessed. And that God, uh, through the words of songs, through the words of the message, that God, you'll speak to us, that we might be the kind of people that you want us to be. So use this service for your grace and for your glory. In Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Enjoy the service today. Good morning, Westbrook. So happy to see you guys. If you would stand and join us, we're going to sing. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing.
You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Hey there, Westbrook Online. Welcome to Westbrook Church. It's super that you are with us today as we jump into a new month and a new fall season. And as we continue through this series, uh, as we study through the New Testament book of Acts, uh, the book of Acts is one of my favorite books of the Bible for a lot of different reasons. Number one, I'm a history lover and I'm always intrigued at how important things play out and how we're able to see the full spectrum of history, in this case, uh, God's history, and we can see how it unfolds. It's almost like if you stand at the top of the football stadium far above the players and you watch the play, you can see how the play develops and how the play evolves, sometimes planned, sometimes spontaneously, and in a biblical sense, supernaturally. Furthermore, I'm a church lover, I love the local body of believers, and I love seeing in Scripture how God designed the church, and, and he designed the church to be his hands and his feet here on this earth. And I love the value that the church can express in people's hearts and people's lives, even with its warts, even with its wrinkles, without a doubt, the church is filled with messy people. And so for sure, it's not going to be perfect, yet it is still God's channel to bring hope and faith and peace to people who are in desperate need of all of that and in desperate need of community. Now, we've spent a bunch of weeks looking at the book of Acts, the, the church, and, and seeing how the church was what was next for them, and the church was God's answer to that question that the early followers were no doubt asking. The first followers of Jesus had just seen their hero and their leader, Jesus, killed and buried. They had seen him resurrected. They met with him and talked with him and saw his scars. One guy even touched the scars in his hands and in his side, 
so that he would truly believe that indeed it was Jesus. Well, as the book of Acts begins, we see this band of followers sitting in this house, huddled together in bewilderment, most assuredly asking the question, now what? Well, God's answer, as I said, to the now what question was the church. The church focused on Jesus, the church uh, that is gospel-centered, the church that is built on community, that the church is, that is for all people was the next step. And, and as it began as the next step for people to connect with then, it still is the next step for people who are seeking to live a meaningful life now. We're sort of near the middle of the book, and we've seen some incredible stories of life change. We've seen powerful stories of transformation, and we're starting to see some stories of challenge. We shouldn't be completely surprised. I mean, if, if people are a part of anything, it can, be, it can become messy, right? Well, as we saw last week, and we're going to see again today, Acts chapter 15 is some messiness. Last week, we talked about some of the political challenges that faced the church. Who's wrong? Who's right? Who should we follow? Well, in today's message, let's take a peek at some personality changes that cropped up in this new church. Anybody out there on the online world familiar with personality problems? How, how about personality problems within the church? Anybody who's listening, you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Anybody listening is familiar with church drama or church hurt or church disappointment? Oh yeah, if you've spent any time and any level of engagement in the local church, you probably know what I'm talking about. Why? Well, it's because messy people create messes. Anytime people are involved in anything, there's going to be some disagreement, right? Reminds me of the little phrase that I quoted some months back. It goes like this, to dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, well, now that's a different story. I heard a few weeks back a story that was told in a book entitled Great Church Fights. The author, Leslie Flynn, tells the story of, of two porcupines who were, who were freezing in the north woods and they, they tried to huddle together to keep warm, but, but when they got close, their quills pricked each other and they had to move apart. You see, they needed each other for the warmth, but they needled each other with their sharp quills. Church members are often like those porcupines. We need each other, but we needle each other. Another Christian author named Vance Havner observed this. He said, there are many porcupine Christians. They have good points, but you can't get near them. Now, we all know that we are called to love one another, right? I mean, it doesn't sound very spiritual to admit that there are Christians that, that, that we just don't like, but let's talk to reality. Their, their personalities sometimes great on us. There are people who, in my world, their personalities great on mine. The way they do things is always counter to the way that I do things. And, 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 and the way that I do things, of course, is always the right way. You cannot get involved in serving the Lord through the local church for very long before you run into someone whose personality clashes with yours. So let's talk about this today for a moment because it's important that we learn to deal with such situations for several reasons. First of all, the command to love one another is not a minor one. It is the second greatest commandment, and it is in, in, in intricately linked to, the, linked to the greatest commandment, which is to love God. John tells us in 1 John 4.20, if we do not love our brother whom we have seen, we cannot love God whom we have not seen. So it's not a minor thing. Christian, Christian unity is not a, a minor matter. Jesus prayed before his death that, that, that we would be perfected in unity so that the world would know that the Father had sent him. We just can't shrug it off. Furthermore, I've seen many Christians who, who get discouraged and they quit serving the Lord as a result of a clash with another believer. Sometimes they, they even grow disillusioned or cynical about the Christian life because of the clash that either they have observed or they have experienced in the life of the church. 
and, and, and they get hurt and they then wrongly conclude Christianity doesn't work. Christians are just hypocrites and as a result, they fall away from the Lord. So I think it's important that we learn what the Bible teaches about dealing with personality differences so that the enemy, listen, the enemy may not derail you from following the Lord Jesus. Well, for our instruction in these matters, interestingly, Luke, the author here, he records and reports honestly a clash that occurred between two great men of God, Paul and Barnabas. If you have your Bibles out there, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 15. We talked about uh, Paul and Barnabas a few weeks ago, remember? Uh, an unlikely duo, uh, uh, unstoppable impact. Well, 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 frankly, here in chapter 15, we're gonna read it in a second, it, it, it's not a pretty picture. Listen, these two guys who were very much put together by the Holy Spirit, pretty much locked horns. I mean, they got into it. They had a, they had a pretty harsh disagreement that caused them to go their separate ways. Now, I wish that he reported that they both repented of their anger and they asked forgiveness for one another, but he does not. I assume from a few later brief references that that, that did happen, or at least there was no lingering bitterness, but, but the clash led to a rupture in a close working relationship between these two godly men. And I think we can learn some stuff from this part of the church history book, namely, get this down, Christians must be diligent to maintain unity and to continue serving the Lord in spite of personality clashes. Here's how it reads. Glance at your Bibles, if you will. It says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and, and, and see how they are doing. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. And they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches." Let's break this down a little bit. After the Jerusalem council had resolved the issue of whether Gentile believers needed to be circumcised and follow the Mosaic law, if you missed that sermon last week, go back on YouTube and watch it again, Uh, we see Paul and Barnabas, they started packing then after that for a second missionary journey to visit the the churches that they had previously established. And as we just read, there was this disagreement arose over whether to include John Mark in their mission. Well, John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. He had accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. However, he had left the mission prematurely, which had, had led to a rift between this dynamic duo. What's going on here? I mean, Paul and Barnabas, they were not new believers. Both Paul and Barnabas, they had been walking with God for years. They were both fully committed to doing the will of God, no matter the cost. They had risked their lives for the sake of Christ. They had been selected by the Holy Spirit to work together. And yet here, what we see, we see them clashing. Indeed, Paul and Barnabas had a long history of serving together. In fact, if you remember, it was Barnabas who had gone to Paul and listened to his testimony when every other Christian in Jerusalem was holding him at arm's length. It was Barnabas who went to Tarsus to to look for Saul and brought him back to labor with him in the ministry in Antioch. The two men, again, had been set apart and commissioned together to go out on the first missionary journey. And on that historic mission, they had suffered together for the cause of Christ. Also, this clash erupted out of godly concern on Paul's part to revisit the churches that they had, that they had seen God establish on their first missionary journey to, to see how they were doing in the Lord both of these men had a heart for the well-being of these churches, and yet, yet these two teammates who had labored together and suffered together uh, for many years in the cause of Christ, they went at it, right? Here's the truth. Spiritual maturity does not erase personality differences that can lead to strong clashes, 
As Paul and Barnabas prepared for their second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to give John Mark another chance and, and include him in the team. Barnabas, Barnabas says that Mark was with them on the last journey and, and he's ready to go again. Barnabas is not bothered by the fact that, that he had to return to Jerusalem uh, on the first trip. However, however, Paul disagreed. He, he didn't want John Mark to come, right? I mean, Mark had, Mark, John Mark had left before any of the cities had, had persecuted them. He had, he had not seen the Jews of Antioch of Pisidia chase them through the cities of Asia Minor, persecuting them. Mark had, 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 had not seen what happened in Lystra, where when Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead. Listen, if he bailed out on the first trip before the going got hard, what will happen this time if he experiences the persecution of the Jews? And so this disagreement between Paul and Barnabas grew sharp and intense, the text says. Well, unable to reach a resolution, Paul and Barnabas, they, they made the difficult decision to part ways. Barnabas took John Mark and they sailed to Cyprus, their homeland, to continue their ministry there. Paul selected Silas as his new companion. They headed towards Syria and Cilicia. And while the split between Paul and Barnabas marked a moment of division, Listen, it's important to note that, that it doesn't seem to be marked by animosity or, or bitterness. In fact, later on in his ministry, Paul's perspective about John Mark seemed to soften as he mentions him in a positive light. In fact, write down and read later Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10 and, and, and read Philemon, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 24. Those verses, as you read them, they, they suggest that reconciliation and restoration likely occurred between them. More than anything, though, the, the sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas underscores the reality that even faithful and committed believers can have conflicts and, listen, differing viewpoints. We're not all the same. We're not all going to think the same. However, this incident also highlights the importance of grace and redemption and, and listen, and the ability for God to use disagreements to further his purposes. Think about it. Sure, they, they, they sparred, right? They sparred. But, but the division ultimately led to the formation of two missionary teams expanding the reach of the gospel. See? Now, I, I wish that Christians would never spar. I really do. Christians, especially colleagues, I wish that they, ever, they would always get along. I mean, I mean, we're all on the same team and we're all pulling in the same direction. We all want the same outcome, right? People to come to faith in Jesus Christ, right? Why can't we all just get along? Why does there have to be disagreements? I'm all about peace and, and, and victory and unity, right? However, I'm, I'm not so naive to think that that will always happen. I've been down this road long enough to know that, that not everybody is going to get along with everybody all the time about everything, right? And unfortunately, I have had some, some firsthand experience with disagreements and with squabbles with people that I have deeply loved. And some of those spats and those quarrels, they, they resulted in the severing of work connections and work relationships. And a few of those conflicts resulted in the severing of personal relationships, and, and, and frankly, my heart still grieves over that. Well, what are we to do? How do we move forward without breaking relationship with the church and with other followers of Jesus? We, I think we can learn some things from the story of, 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 of Paul and Barnabas here. What are we to do? Here's the first thing that we need to do. Write this down. Realize that conflicts are a part of human relationships. You, you probably already know that, but, but realize that again, again and again and again. Conflicts are a natural and an inevitable part of human relationships due to a, a variety of factors stemming from our individual differences and from our different perspectives and from our emotions. I mean, think about it, right? People have diverse perspectives. People come from different backgrounds and cultures and experiences and beliefs, and the diversity often leads to varying perspectives and opinions and ways of approaching situations. Those differences sometimes can lead to clashes when trying to find common ground. And many times there is a communication breakdown. 
Misunderstandings can arise due to misinterpretations of word or tone or body language. Effective communication is complex and and even well-intentioned conversations can sometimes be misconstrued. Then emotions play a significant role in conflicts, yes? I mean, I mean, people have strong emotional triggers, and when these are activated, it can lead to strong reactions, and, and if we're not careful, it can escalate disagreements. Not to mention there are unmet expectations. Conflicts often arise when people ha- have differing expectations about outcomes or behaviors or contributions, and when these expectations are not met, It can lead to disappointment and tension. I could go on and on and on, right? Conflicts can occur when personal boundaries are crossed or violated. I could talk about change and transition. Change is often met with resistance, and and transitions can trigger conflicts as people adjust to new circumstances or roles or dynamics. And then there's stuff like power dynamics and value and priority differences and personal growth and maturity. There are, there are external factors such as work or, or, or stress or financial strain or health issues. All of those things can impact emotional well-being and can contribute to conflicts in relationships. Yes, yes, conflicts are a natural part of human relationships, but they don't have to be destructive. Conflicts can lead to growth. Conflicts can lead to understanding and improved communication if managed effectively. Listen, listen, listen. Learning how to address conflicts in a respectful and constructive manner is a valuable skill that can strengthen relationships and foster understanding among individuals. I think Paul and Barnabas both knew that a person's greatest strengths are often the area for his greatest weaknesses. Paul's strength was his resolute commitment to follow Christ, no matter what the cost, and to stand firm in his convictions. He he even publicly confronted a powerful man like Peter, right? You could beat Paul, throw him in prison, stone him, whatever, but you could not stop him from proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified as the only way to salvation. Paul's weakness was his inability to accept and work with a weaker man like Mark, who had potential, but he just wasn't there yet. Paul's later comments regarding Mark, as well as other scriptures he wrote, shows that he overcame that weakness. Thank goodness. Barnabas' greatest strength was his ability to encourage the faint-hearted and to help the weak. He was the champion of the outsider and the fringe person. He, he knew how to show grace to those who had failed, but he erred on the side of showing grace to those who maybe needed to be confronted. As Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 13, even Barnabas was carried away with the hypocrisy of Peter and the other Jews who withdrew from eating with the Gentile Christians out of fear of offending the Judaizers. So the lesson is, know yourself. Where by God's grace are you strong and, and gifted? Exercise that strength for his glory, but also realize that sometimes, sometimes clashes may come. And they don't all have to end in chaos and people hating each other. Here's the second thing to get down. Recognize that working through conflicts is attainable without breaking relationship. Let me say that again. Recognize that working through conflicts is attainable without breaking relationship. You know, over the years of my ministry and working with people, I have had hundreds and hundreds of personality clashes and disagreements and frustrating conversations and the like. Only a few of them ended in people choosing sides, leaving the church, emotions short of hating me. And I'm not gonna lie, right? The ones that ended like that, oh goodness, they still hurt. It's been years for some of them, but the thought of, of that severing of connections still stings. I think, I think it hurts God's heart as well. You know, if I've learned anything from Pete Scazzaro's book called Emotionally Healthy uh, Spirituality, if you've not seen that book or read it, you ought to maybe grab that and, and, and find it and, and read it, right? 
uh, if I'd read, learned anything from reading this book, I, I learned that there's this thing called a fair fight. <laughs> he, he talks about a, a, a fair fight, right? Where, where you intentionally enter a clash or a conversation with, with some ground rules that result in truly understanding what the other is saying. And, and even if you're still at odds with, when, when the conversation is over, you can leave it in peace and resolve to stay together. And, and, and boy, oh boy, do I know that that's hard for, for some people. In fact, some time back, while leaning into a conflict with a person, I, uh, I said to that person, I said, are we going to fight about this? <laughs> meaning, meaning a fair fight, right? I, I was using Scazzaro's own words, for goodness sakes. Later on, though, the person told another person that I threatened a fist fight. I wasn't threatening a fist fight. I, I, I'm afraid of fist fights. I've never, ever, ever been in a fist fight. I'm not going to go searching for a fist fight. I just really wanted to resolve the challenge, and I was up for some hard conversation. I've been privy to hundreds of resolved conflicts and, and know that no matter how harsh they may be, they don't always have to end bad. Well, what are we to do when people needle us? <laughs> Lastly, remember that God is still sovereign. What, what, what we see here is, is that even human disagreement, even with human disagreement, God still has the last word. Now, now, now even in spite of man's selfish tendencies, God's will can be accomplished. Now there are two mission teams accomplishing the Great Commission. Why? Because we serve a sovereign God who works his to his will to accomplish his purposes in spite of us. And, and we need to remember there's also another dynamic at work, right? If, 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 listen, if Satan can damage the church, if he cannot damage the church through false teaching, as we saw in the Jerusalem council, he will try to hurt the church from the inside. Yeah, his, his tactic is to stir up discord among brothers within the church. If, and if he can cause those leaders to, to disagree, perhaps the church can be damaged from the inside. Yet a God, remember, God still has the last word. The British Admiral, Lord Nelson, once came on deck and he found two of his officers, they were quarreling, right? They were quarreling with each other and, and he whirled them around and he pointed to the enemy ships and he exclaimed, gentlemen, those are your enemies. When we face personality differences in the church, we need to be diligent. We need to be diligent to guard the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We need to seek to work out our differences, if possible, in a spirit of love and kindness. And if we must part ways, we should continue serving the Lord and not let the enemy get us to attack those whom God has given different personalities than he has given us. Truly, may it be. Out of chaos, life is being found. 
Thank you all for singing with us this morning. You can go ahead and take a seat. 